The Franks, one of the Germanic peoples who interacted with the Roman Empire in late antiquity, both as ally and as enemy, were originally centered on the Rhine, but as the 5th century progressed, the Franks, led by Childeric, and then by his son Clovis, gradually inherited Roman Gaul through a process of actual settlement undertaken by the Roman state, and through a policy of conquest. Arguably, the key moment comes in 486 at the Battle of Soissons, when the Franks, led by Clovis, fought against the forces of Syagrius, leader of the so-called Kingdom of Soissons, really a historiographical term more than anything else, used to refer to a chunk of northern Gaul that represented Roman political continuity in the region, and after the Franks win this battle, Roman control in the west pretty much ends. Our principal source for what comes next in the 6th century, as well as for events in the 5th century, like Soissons, are the writings of Gregory, Bishop of Tours. We cannot necessarily take him at his word for every single thing he writes, as he had his own biases and his own purposes for writing, but if nothing else, we can understand that there are themes in his writings that Frankish aristocrats would understand and be familiar with. Claiming ancestry from Merovich, who some accounts state as being the offspring of a Frank named Clodio and a sea monster, Clovis's dynasty, the Merovingians, established political hegemony across the old Roman frontier of the Rhine for the first time, and while their political core remained in northern Gaul, their territory extended across most of the former Roman province into what is today Bavaria, as well as northern Italy, and their political influence was felt farther afield, potentially as far away as the modern Czech Republic in the British Isles. The creation of a ruling dynasty was actually a fairly new idea amongst many Germanic peoples in late antiquity, and it's been suggested by some scholars that perhaps the whole idea of a dynasty comes from steppe influence, which would make sense, as we know that the Huns had some influence over at least some groups of Franks, before they were largely unified under Childeric and Clovis. Following Frankish custom, upon Clovis's death, the kingdom was divided between his sons in 511, and again after his son Clotar died in 561, and again divided after the death of Dagobert in 639. Each time the realm was split up, the inheriting sons went to war with each other and attempted to conquer the entire kingdom for themselves, with the result being that between 511 and 679, the Merovingian kingdom experienced something like 22 years of actual hegemony and peace, and 146 years of conflict in some form. At the same time, though, there was actually a good deal of military expansion. It's in the midst of all this infighting and external conquest that two key things happened to the Merovingian political situation. The first is that, under the reign of Theodobert, who wasn't really the overarching king of the Merovingian lands, and more so one of the kings of one of the divisions of state following the death of Clovis, which we call Austrasia, the Franks began to experiment with Roman ideas. Theodobert intervened in the attempted conquest of Italy by the Romans between 535 and 555, and he also began to use Roman imagery and symbolism in Austrasia. This was a key development in Frankish politics because Austrasia spanned both the Roman and non-Roman sides of the Rhine, and it made it clear that this state was here to stay, and when the use of that imagery is combined with recognition from the court at Constantinople, it maybe begins to look like some form of a Roman Empire in the West is beginning to reassert itself. But the actual Roman Empire, centered now in the East, began to be offended by what they saw as barbarian pretensions to imperial rule. The second crucial development is that, by at least 589, when an aristocrat named Rouching attempts what looks like, or what's written in the text as a coup, which fails by the way, is the growing power of the Frankish aristocracy at the expense of the Merovingian kings. Aristocrats were independently wealthy, with much of that wealth coming from the ownership of land, and they had their own retinues and militaries, which they used to engage in a form of honor culture. Upholding their own social standing and using troops to right perceived wrongs, often violently. These aristocrats often formed their own factions, the overall aim of which was to dominate the Merovingian kings. Theoretically, when kings were full-grown adults, they could dominate these court factions, but when they were children and their mothers governed for them, the situation was a bit more difficult. Women were not taken as seriously, and nearly every surviving text on the subject was written by people who viewed women unfavorably. However, it's been determined by scholars that women probably did have a great deal of power in this period, they just had to fight to maintain it a bit more than men did. The key thing here with the aristocratic factions is twofold. 
Pop culture and other mediums can lead us to imagining aristocrats as being based out of fortified structures, the stereotypical castles of the medieval period. While not incorrect, that is very much a high medieval feature in the early period, which is when the Merovingians ruled, saw aristocrats based not in castles, but rather it frequently sees them based around monasteries and other religious places, claiming sanctuary within them and thus freedom from harm. The second key to the factions is that after about 639, the actual power of the king seriously begins to wane, and we have a new power structure gradually developing alongside those aristocratic factions. Clotard II seized power in 613, after having Queen Brunhild torn apart by horses, and he keeps the three territorial divisions into which the Frankish realm had at this point largely been divided, Austrasia, Neustria, and Burgundy. The kings of these states were technically sub-kings, who were supposed to be loyal to the overall Merovingian king, but Clotar reworks this system. Instead of sub-kings, he replaces the office with that of the mayor, and there was supposed to be only one mayor for each region. So those aristocratic factions become focused on obtaining that office, and after 639, with the death of Dagobert, the office of mayor begins to clash strongly with the position of queen regent, leading to new power struggles in the Merovingian kingdom. So, these political developments are eventually what leads to the mayors growing in power over about a hundred year period, with the power of many of those kings decreasing, eventually culminating in a series of military conflicts where the forces of Austrasia defeat the forces of Neustria at the Battle of Tertiary in 687, and the mayor of Austrasia, Pippin II, becomes mayor for the entirety of the Merovingian lands. His son, Charles, usually known as Charles Martel, or Charles the Hammer, eventually was able to take power more fully, and it's through his line that the Carolingian family ousted the Merovingians and became the new royal dynasty of the Franks, the Carolingians. It's these developments in the 7th century that have caused historians to look for where and when exactly the Merovingian kings actually lost power to the aristocrats and to the mayors. Some older literature puts forth the argument that it's under Clotar II that the Merovingians began to really lose control, but some others would argue that it was really under the Queen Regent Brunhild, or maybe under Dagobert's sons. A more balanced view is maybe less of a search for an ah, yes, this is it moment. So, not a specific event, but maybe more of a recognition that, like so much else in history, the rise of the Carolingians and the mayors, and the decline of the Merovingians, was more of a process of interrelated events that occurred over time, and not a clear-cut action by any one party at any specific date. But any way you look at the political history of the Merovingians, by at least 700, the power of the kings was on the wane, and the dominance of the Carolingians was becoming ever more clear.